I'm Lorraine. I'm living my life. I am loving my son, just in a different format. I'm okay. We always said at the time it was a complete surprise. And it was a complete surprise. Looking back, the only thing was about two weeks earlier, he had brought up this question about broken helmets. And he says, does this pain last long? And I, I did say something like, yep, it goes on and on and on. And as the years go by, it gets worse and worse. And the more time your heart gets broken, the more your confidence is sapped and sucks the life out of you. Uh, that does play on my mind, but I was also fully aware that that wouldn't have changed the decision. That was mum just being sarky. Mum, he was quite used to that. So yeah, this is my brother. Um, still quite heavy. Um, never really decided what we're going to do with the ashes. Um, I quite like to spread them, but we've held on to them for like three years, so we've kind of settled for having them here. So yeah. Um. And there was uh, again during that last fortnight once he came home from college. And he took his boots off, he was sitting there, and he took his boots off. And uh, I said, you're right. He said, no, and I don't want to talk about it. Thanks, Mum. I went off to bed. He was broken hearted. But at the time, we all said it was just a moment's fog, which I think it was. I don't think he'd been unhappy for months and months and months or years and years. And I don't think it was. I think it was a, a moment's fog. No, two weeks awful tummy in your mouth feeling which he chose to keep to himself um, yeah this is used to be his old room um, after we kind of after the initial sort of shock of it all thought what we were going to do with this room he didn't have a lot of things but some um, but you know he, uh, he had his bed there that keyboard over there, the base somewhere over here, like an assortment of bits and bobs, and um, uh, my twin brothers who were training in a room at the time, uh, one of them got this room, and he left it in the state, so uh, we've repainted it, and, like taken stuff out of it, and like painted it inside the cupboard. So I mean, it's a nice room, but it's not my brother's room anymore. That's how I see it, but. It's just for him. I'm Taylor, and I'm just carrying on with my life. That was such a bad. Oh. Yeah, this is just some like. Little things we kind of kept after he passed away. My mum served these um, weird treasure troves, like for anything that's worth keeping. We um, all have a box like this and we put oh, stuff in it. This was lovely. His record of achievement um, they get from school and it's what they think and value. Oh, no, oh I haven't got glasses here. But from memory, I can remember. He'd written something about his oh my God. things that he's proud of. Um, two weeks of work experience during judo and having a test dummy giving me a more more of an under oh he was a test dummy giving me more understanding of his sport. Coming first at Skills London with the school in an indoor rowing race with a distance of 568 miles. At the time, um, I had a lot going on. I was, I was at college and I started a job and I had a girlfriend and I was scared. I was heading off to uni pretty soon. So there weren't obvious factors when it initially happened and it was a massive shock to the system. But in hindsight, there were incidences incidents um when it could be like it could have related like there was a time when jay first 
lost his call with my mum's boyfriend and he never loses his call. And um, it was over an argument about washing dishes and he just picked one up, smashed it on the floor and I told him, just go upstairs, chill out for a bit, I'll be up there in a second to talk about it. And he said, oh, I just lost my temper, it's all right, it's nothing. And there were a few small incidents, like when he came home, a bit upset. But I was sort of caught up in my own little world that I didn't notice. Doing the 1500 metres for sports day, filling in for someone else. Discovered how to Google SketchUp for the first time ever. The things that he was proud of that surprised us. Being son of a teacher was made me well known to others in my year. The things that he's proud of. I, I, there weren't anything, any sort of hints that he wanted to take in my life. I mean, there were typical teenage sort of tantrums. You know, there was at least one of those, but it wasn't anything we really took into serious consideration. Like, we all all have a moment when we're teens to say, oh, I wish I was dead. And, but, you know, that was years before he actually ended up taking his own life. So, I don't think that was connected. And there were, there were a few little things. Like, he argued with my mum more than he's ever done before. And he doesn't argue a lot. And he was um, quite reserved with me for a while, and I don't didn't know why. Um, but in, I was caught up in my own little world that I didn't really notice. My name is Sarah, and I survived suicide. Um, I attempted suicide in May two thousand and ten, and everything sort of started September two thousand and nine, so the year before, um, and. Basically, I got talking to a guy that I knew um, on Facebook. I didn't know him very well, I just knew of him. Um, and he friended me on Facebook because we were both leaders at the same scout troop, so I accepted him because that's what you do. Um, and he, he basically groomed me. Um, it didn't get sort of, like nothing happened, um, but I was so disgusted with myself that I'd let him talk to me in the way that he did and that I responded to him. Um, and I sort of realised what he was doing and said, look, you need to stop. Um, and he did. Um, and then it was, I think January is a bad time for me anyway. I find January really hard to get through because there's not much sunlight and I just get kind of down. Um, and it got to the January and I really started thinking about sort of how far it could have gone um, and, you know, what could have happened. Um, and I got really down because of that. And um, I developed an eating disorder because just sort of everything got on top of me and I'd asked him if I was under 16 if he'd have done anything um, and he said no so in my mind um, I figured that if I didn't eat and look like a child then maybe he'd leave me alone and nothing like that would happen again so it sort of started as not eating um, and then I started self-harming and I just I couldn't cope and I hadn't told anyone and I didn't really know what to do so I just kept starving myself and self-harming um, and in my head about March time I decided that I wanted to be a certain weight um, and worked my butt off to get to that weight and it, I was doing everything I could and I didn't get to that weight um, and then one day I woke up and I don't, it, was, it was like an impulse, it was, I, I'd say I acted on impulse um, it was a Friday and I, in my head I had, it has to happen on Monday. I didn't know what it was that had to happen on Monday. Um, but in my head it was, you've, you can't lose this weight, you, you're not good enough, you're, you can't go on like you are. Um, so whatever has to happen is happening on the Monday. And I woke up on the Monday and I took a razor to the toilets in my college and I slit my wrist. I'm Pete, I've made two suicide attempts in my life. I'd struggled with issues of depression, drink, drug, substance abuse for a long time before that and my first, my previous suicide attempt was when I was 18. So there were actually 20 years separating my two suicide attempts and in between it kind of remained pretty much 
a constant. It was hovering in my mind, not always to the forefront, but it was always kind of there. So, yeah, it's something that I kind of live with. And, for, and I think this is common with a lot of people who have a borderline personality disorder or other severe mental illnesses. Um, you kind of think that everyone thinks like that, you know? And it's a shock to think, oh, wow, other people don't think of suicide every day, you know? Um, so, yeah, it was gradual. Um, but equally, the moment when I decided to overdose was really very impulsive. It was like, I think it was a fact that because it was Christmas time and there was a long weekend and so there was no work and if I was just left by myself at that time all I was doing was damaging myself. I was either at work and I could still do a pretty good day's work actually um, but when I was on my own I just drank and cut and it was horrible and gruelling and whenever I left the house I felt intense shame um, I couldn't talk to anyone because I was crippled with that kind of shame. And I thought, you know, I can't do four days or whatever it was on my own. So it really was a sense I just can't do the next four days. So in that sense, it was pretty impulsive. Um, I think when I was 18, yeah, my immaturity certainly played Apart. That was possibly even more impulsive. I'd led a kind of sheltered upbringing and gone to a grammar school, all boys, cripplingly shy. And I was at university, not because I wanted to be at university, that's just because well, everyone channels you towards. And I had no idea what else I may want to do, so fair enough. That's what people do, they go to university. I got there, found intensely painful um, just dealing with people dealing with emotions I mean looking back that was borderline personality disorder a very early manifestation of that and I'm thinking because everyone says university is kind of the best years of your life in my mind I'm thinking well these, this is the best it's gonna get I kind of I'm out of here you know and that again it just seemed, you know, it seemed a choice, an impulsive choice, but the choice was, you know, I, this is life, I, I reject it, you know? Angela, um, and I'm a survivor of, of, of suicide. Oh, most definitely. When I look back, I didn't like myself. I didn't like what I'd become. Um, I came from a uh, an abusive, um, violent upbringing. Um, I'd lived on the streets from the age of 13 uh, to about 14 and a half. I'd spent time um, in a correctional school for wayward girls. Um, I'd got involved uh, in drugs um, and crime and um, throughout my youth and then kind of got myself on the straight and narrow uh, and started to rebuild my life and my confidence um, and went I went on to have a, a good job. Um, and then I met my ex-husband. Um, he was a bully, basically. Um, very charming in the beginning. Very, very charming. Um, I couldn't take, I couldn't take the abuse, 
Um, it churned up stuff from my childhood. I think I'd never dealt with my childhood issues. I've never dealt with the anger and the hurt and the pain. Um, so it was a it was a culmination of, of kind of going through life and kind of looking back and just thinking, you know, is this it? I didn't feel that I'd ever get away from my husband. Um, he'd threatened that he would find me. I'm scared. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'd been to the police on one occasion and it just, back in those days, they weren't really interested. So I didn't, and she didn't even try, and I uh, tweaked that, she probably couldn't. Yeah. On that, the night I come in late from work, I had parents' evening, it was six o'clock-ish, and I walked straight through the door, normally I'd shut up and say, hi, yeah, blah, 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 and Jeffy was here. And I didn't, I just dived straight off back to Tesco's and I bought him tiger rolls, hazard and salad to belly and tiger rolls, he loves that kind of stuff. And I didn't say goodbye, what you want, anything, so I knew I'd be 10 minutes. And um, when I got back, I assumed he was upstairs and Anna had come round, it's Taylor's girlfriend, waiting for him. I was here, Danny was here, and we thought Jeffy was upstairs. And Taylor ran, oh, it's been about a quarter to eight. Must have been about a quarter to eight. And had this really distressing text from Jafey, implying that this was going to happen. And he wouldn't have, he would not have made any... We knew it was serious. The first thing I tried to do was get his friends on Facebook, Sean Bastow, it was a big one, to see if he could contact Jafe. We couldn't get hold of Jeff to see if he could contact Jeff to see if he knew anything was wrong. I instantly, and I'm not a Catholic, but I do use saints a lot, um, looked up the painter saint for lost children and lit a candle and prayed and I got no joy and I said straight away, just help him with the next step. And I got peace. Then I rang the police and said, I'll be taking this seriously and please look for my son, keep your eyes open for my son. And I said, I have to go, I've got trains, I've got water here, I have to find my son. And they kept saying, just stay there, just stay there, we've got people trained for this, just stay there, we're sending some around. They kept me on the phone, repeating questions, what's he wearing, and description, and then again, sorry, can you give me a description again? Because what I didn't realise was at the same time, the call was coming through that they'd had a jumper at Bedhampton. And I, I worked in a pub um, as a KP. Yeah, a bit of coke now and again. Um, and it was just a standard Saturday. Um, my brother recently started working with the same pub. I got him a job there. And he did the morning shift and I, I think... He did. Yeah, he did the morning shift, I believe. And I did, like, the after-lunch shift. And... You know, everything was fine, normal. Um, and it was his birthday coming up soon. So I decided to do him a favour and book the whole time off work so he could have a party in for his 18th. And about... About quarter to eight, eight o'clock time, um, I got a text from him saying, um, this is goodbye. Uh, please tell mum I'm sorry. And... There were, I've never been sort of told how to deal with that or told, you know, this is a, like, a, this is a suicide note or, you know, this is how he's going to say goodbye. So I didn't know how to take it. So um, I initially dismissed her and sent her a text back thinking it was a friend's joke saying, this isn't funny. Um, is this a joke? You know, something around those lines. Um, it's only when I finished work about... 20 minutes later, I started to call him. Um, I started to get worried because I called him once and it didn't go through. And I called him a second time, it didn't go through. Called him a third time, didn't go through. And then the, the, the alarm bell started to go. 
it kind of went right. Um, I gotta find out if he's home. Rang home. Mum picked up. Said, "Is Jafe there? You know, is Jafe there?" And she shouted upstairs, and there was no reply. And she said, "Oh no, she he isn't in." Um. And this was unusual for him because he doesn't he didn't go out a lot, you know, minus for college and seeing some friends now and again. But he always told us where he was going. I don't go to happy events. They make me feel comfortable because I can never reach that plateau of being happiness. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So I just wander around feeling either make myself make a big effort, which makes me feel uncomfortable, or be the true me, which is quite morose and quiet. Hey guys, it's just a train station, and I got to the train station in the end, and all the direct, all the trains were delayed or cancelled, and it I didn't twig that it could be a suicide or anything like that. And all I was considered, like, all I was concerned about was getting home and in the quickest way I can. So I rang up my mate, and, um, his name's Adam, and he has a little half-reliant, half-triumph, like, half half-whatever, half whatever trike. And um, he picked me up, and it was a death trap. I probably stood more chance of surviving the train, like uh, the walk home than getting on the bike, but I risk it. Gone, gone it, got home, and they hadn't found him. And I just looked at her and she said, you need to sit down. And I said, oh no, call Taylor. And we, we I can, that scream. We screamed, we hugged. And just, go well, you're not hugging, you're, you're gr grasping. You're absolutely grasping. She said, sit down, you can't sit down, you can't sit down. We just, we just held on to each other so, so tightly and screamed. And I will remember the sound of that scream. I really will for the rest of my life. And I was crying. And they called Annie and Adam back. They just said, you need to come home. No, by then I was out in the hall. I don't know, I'd go out the hall. We probably went through and I just went and stood against the hall wall. And then he just came back and I just nodded, didn't say anything, just nodded. He just nodded. And for, that was probably the toughest time in my life. That sort of sudden realisation that you know, this could be my brother, you know, I've just lost someone. I saw that small that morning. So it was a, a bit of, it was just blind panic. And when I eventually sort of like pulled myself together and stood up, I sit down, I sit down, sit down with a um, photo of them. And you know, I was, I started praying, I'm a bit, I'm a bit religious. And I started praying really hard saying, look, just make what whatever happens. Just make sure it's not him. It could be anyone else. I don't really care. Just as long as it's not him. It's a very fast looking back, is it? Because the text to Taylor must be about quarter to eight, but it was confirmed at eight twenty-five that he had died at eight o five. I know Taylor tried to contact him, but Jeffy had turned his phone off. He said he was going to do it, and he did it. Exact decision making and implications, and implemented it thoroughly with due diligence. It transpired that whilst I was in Tesco getting goodies for Jafy, that he had walked to Bedhampton. Deliberately, he didn't take his phone, ID, all the things people normally take. Um, I know the route, where he crossed, how he was, because it was all on CCTV camera, wasn't it? So I asked how he was, did he seem distressed, did he seem uncertain, did he seem unsure? No, he walked up to the other line when the train was coming, he knew it was a straight through fast train, he knew it would be 70 mile an hour, he looked briefly towards the train by the other line and just leaned forward without any hesitation at all. 
I think when you know somebody's that determined to leave the world with such composure and to say goodbye first to the, the guy who wanted to go. I quite respect him for doing it as quickly and assuredly as he did. Because I know he made a decision. And he's expedient in it. And I have to respect that. There's not much we do about it anyway now, is there? In terms of other people, or people left behind, certainly speaking for myself, no one could have reached him. And that was actually what was crippling the isolated. I, um, you know, I had people. I could, people would tell me all the time, just call me and that. But it's like, you know, I can't call you and explain what I'm feeling. It would kind of scare you to death. It was at the point I needed professional help, and I was getting professional help, and it wasn't helping. So, in terms of all the, you know, I've got a wide circle of friends, and my family is pretty supportive, uh, mum and dad, they're still alive, still together, but there was no one that could have reached out and got close to me because I was so, you know, in this kind of, this bubble, you know, partly self-created to isolate myself from the world, and partly I just couldn't explain the way I was feeling because I didn't understand myself. So, you know, it wasn't, anyone else let me down, no one could have actually offered any useful support to me at that point. Um, with my most recent suicide attempt was two years ago actually, it was two days before Christmas 2011. Um, so I spent Christmas Eve in A&E with marvellous timing. Um, and at the time, I, I, I have borderline personality uh, disorder and with that suicide, suicidal thoughts, suicidal behaviour is very common, um, you know, without going into the diagnostic criteria, it's quite a severe mental illness in which emotions, uh, we can't find it very hard to deal with emotions, so we end up trying to cut them off generally via drink, drugs, reckless behaviour, self-harming and it's a constant struggle and it's pretty gruelling. Um, I was in therapy for that at the time but like any effective therapy or like many there's a tendency for things to get worse before you actually turn the corner. I was right at that stage. I was having commitment issues with the therapy. Um, I wasn't turning up a lot. I was drinking a hell of a lot. Um, I was self-harming daily. Um, I was incredibly isolated, even though I turned up for work every day, but I'd turn up for work, you know, with fresh cuts and scars on my arm um, and just in a kind of chemical medicated days. And I got up one morning, I left the house to go to work, and I thought, you know, I just can't do this anymore. Again, it's that sense of, this is what I've got to do right now. So I turned around, went home, and swallowed 28 cocodamol, which um, is 960 mg of codeine, and the LD50 for that is 800, like any well-planned suicide. I've been looking into the lethal doses. Um, so I was quite sure that would sort of do the job and that's how I was approaching it at the time. This is a job that needs to be done. Um... For me, it was there was no other option at that point. Um... I couldn't see a way out. It's very, for me, it was very tunnel vision. Um, nothing else mattered. No one else mattered. Um, no one else came into the equation. It was just me and death. Um, and it had been a build up of stuff. Um, 
Yeah. It, it was, I struggled. Um, it wasn't an impulsive choice. It was something I'd been thinking about. Um, especially, um, one, my mum. I, I was kind of, the, the first time I ever attempted it was, it was kind of, what, how would this affect my mum? Um, and then I lost sight of that. Um, and I got up. And I knew fully well what I was doing. Um, and I was very calm. And I'd chosen not to leave any notes. Um, I was in a very difficult relationship, um, which was violent um, and abusive in, in every way. Um, and I got up early one morning. Um, and began crushing uh, tablets. Um, again, there, it, there was, it was so calm. There was nothing rushed. Um, and I slowly put them into, when I'd finished crushing, put them into to glasses of orange juice. Um, and got into bed and closed my eyes. Um, and woke up, I, I don't even, I can't remember the time now, it's, it's a, the first attempt was a long time ago, um, in a hospital, um, and casually being, uh, being sick. Put it in order because you go through so many things. Um, from eight to ten that night, like I say, I've, I've, I've described what happened then. You go into automatic. I couldn't sleep that night, obviously. I just lay on Jafie's bed. And every so often, you, you do drop off through exhaustion, and it might only be for like 12 seconds. You wake up and you do feel it all straight away again. Straight away again. I just cried all night in his bed. Holding this pillow. What I didn't really, I didn't ask where Jafus was for about three days. I assumed there was nothing left of Jafy apart from bits of flesh scattered somewhere around Bedhampton. I didn't think there'd be a Jafy somewhere. I'm going to talk about, um, oh, he, he just came and let me waffle, and I was waffling about. Um, organ donation and I thought, oh God, will there be anything left for there? And he said, would it help to tell you that we have a whole Jafus? And then I, 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 I tried, cried and cried, I wanted my baby, then I wanted to see my baby. But it never dawned on me to ask where he was because I assumed it was annihilation. And it's interesting that Derek didn't say from the off, we've, we've got him, he's safe, he's there. Which is the first thing I'd say, but when you're a grief counsellor, you've got to let people get through grief themselves and ask the questions they want to ask. And because I hadn't mentioned it, he didn't mention it. Uh, but when he told me I had a whole day fee, and that uh, was the first time I asked, and he was in the mortuary in Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, how does it all change? How are people meet? A lot of changes. There are a lot of changes. Uh, Obviously, my my close, sensitive friends um, understand how I how I have changed since Jafie. They understand that I still have talk about Jafie as his, as if he still lives with me because he does in my eyes. He still lives with me. I still live with my son, just in a different format. And they quite happily go along with that. They send me cards, and it's to Jafie as well as all my other children. They don't leave Jafie out. And I really respect that from them. One of the weirdest things was meeting new people. And you talk about you have children, da 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 da. And I would say, yes, I've got four children. <laughs> and of course they say, well, what do they do? Yeah. There's always a bit of a sticky point when I came to Jafie and I say, he travels, he's traveling. 
Say, oh, where is he? Wherever he wants to be. And, and the conversation became so bizarre, you know, but that was the hardest thing is to say I have three children negated the fact he was in my life and part of me and is still in my life. And then I didn't want to make them feel comfortable. So I say he's travelling and I say he's currently in heaven and he's very happy. Move on. Even being a grandmother was difficult, but luckily one of them is my son and he understands. But um, people say, what's it like being a granny? It must be fantastic, you get to get them back, it's wow. And I never got the wow out of being a granny either. But I do enjoy the little chappy now, watching him run about. Now he's a bit older, he's 18 months now. But initially I didn't get the wow. And people keep thrusting babies at me, like I'm supposed to go, oh, isn't it fantastic? And it isn't, it's horrible, don't give me a baby. It's not the baby I want. But I've got better at just saying, rather not. And it must have made people so much. Uh, it's taken away my highs and my lows. That's okay. I think initially I was relieved because in my head I'd had that something had happened on the Monday and, and that had happened and in my head I thought once whatever that thing was had happened I'd be able to move on in some way um, but unfortunately because I was under 18 everything was taken out of my hands so I went to the doctors with my mum um, and they weren't very helpful but I wasn't very talkative so there wasn't too much that they could do um, and they said that I needed to stay off college until they'd sorted something out. So the next day, I'd woke up, um, and because that, everything from the Friday had built up in my head that something was gonna happen on the Monday, and all of that was over, I wanted to get back to normal as soon as possible. So I went to college um, without telling anyone. So at this point, my mum was obviously very worried because I'd attempted suicide the day before, and she didn't know where I'd gone. Um, and she called the police, and then, when I came back home, um, I'd gone to college and then walked around for a bit. When I came back home, the police were here. And that freaked me out a lot because the guy that I was talking to on Facebook is a policeman. So I don't like the police anyway. Um, and so I was very angry. Um, and they, I locked myself in the shed in the garden. And it took a couple of hours to sort of talk me around and get me out. And then they took me to hospital and sectioned me. So everything was taken out of my control. And I didn't really understand what was going on because I, I couldn't understand my thoughts anyway of why I was so down and why I wanted to starve myself and all of that. But in my head, all I'd done was gone to college and they'd sort of taken away all my rights just for going to college. That's all I could think of. I want to help people in the position that I've been in because I feel like there isn't enough support out there. Um, I would love to go into colleges and schools and just let people know that there are resources out there that they can access and I don't know just I feel like there should be like a new job set up for people to to be listeners. I think they're all too busy. This has become a rat race that we live in. Um, no one has time anymore. Um, it's too fast. It's too money orientated. Um, everything feels just so fast for me. Um, out there, people get left, people get forgotten. No one's time. Time is it, it, it's, it's needed. People need to take stock to acknowledge. Because um, we all get wrapped up in our own little world and we forget the person that's next to us. Um, so just if... It's all about greed, I think. And each man for themselves. That's how I perceive the world. Very much so. Um, I would be reluctant to give advice because um, everyone's journey is very specific to them maybe to point out that it is a journey where you're at right now isn't the way you're going to be stuck forever that it, 
you know, that it may seem nowhere, but, um, you know, you can, you do have some kind of agency yourself. Things can change, you can play your part in making them change. Um, and I guess if I were to give out advice, it would be kind of don't make things harder for yourself because try to see you're suffering enough already. Don't add to that with thoughts of shame or thoughts of I shouldn't be feeling like this or I should be feeling some other way or any guilt about other members, have the family members or friends or something. It's, you know, just give yourself a break and recognize your suffering. I think people just need to understand they're victims. I mean, it's only selfish and mean and cruel until it stops becoming a nameless person. Um, you know, it's a person. So you know who it is, it's a victim actually have as advantages or put me first. There's no obstacle that I'm going to face in life which is going to be ever as hard as what we had to go through with my son. I'm immune. I'm indestructible. Just wait for me at the next stop.